um, I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves. So just a brief description of them. There's more of a detailed bio biography of each of them on the back of the agenda. So just briefly, if you can introduce who you are and, and your experience with Parkinson's very briefly, and then I'm gonna have you uh, one by one talk about some, some things you wish you had known uh, when you or, or the person um, you, you care for was first diagnosed. So maybe Pat can start. We're gonna, you can hand hold the microphone here. So oh. there we go. Well, I've got a pretty loud voice, so I don't use. No, that's okay. <laughs> um, my name's Pat Motch. Um, I'm a care partner. My husband, George, who's here, is, uh, has been diagnosed for 16 years. And um, we share pretty well everything still. Thank you. Uh, John Hogan, I was diagnosed in 2007 at uh, 52. If you quickly do the math, that'll make me 61 pretty quick in early December. Uh, so I'm, I'm in the ninth year of this uh, uh, little adventure and journey. My name's Margaret Much. I was diagnosed 13 years ago, and uh, my neurologist likes to tell me at every appointment I'm doing remarkably well. <laughs> My name's Stephen Gardner. I was diagnosed 12 years ago at the age of 43, so I was considered young onset. I was lucky enough to be one of the people that got deep, deep brain stimulation in 2013, and that's been a very successful procedure. So I'm now living with only half the medications that I used to do, and I've got much, less, much more less up and downs than I used to get. Okay, so now if you could each just go through, you know, some some tips or what you wish you had known when, when you're first diagnosed, or in your case, Pat, when, when George was diagnosed. Okay. Um, one of the, the things, and I'll sort of come out here, I, I think that being a care partner is the human experience. We've all been cared for. We've all cared for others. And I think that that's important to know that that's the way it is. We've all had that experience. And no two people with Parkinson's are the same, and no two care partners' experiences are the same. So the things I'm going to say are going to be covering more my experience and what I've seen knowing other care partners and that can be not just with Parkinson's but with other chronic illnesses there are many people who have other chronic illnesses so I think one of the things when I'm talking just generally I'll often call it managing the unexpected we've all had the unexpected we will have more of the unexpected I'm sure there's a play on in Vancouver right now called I didn't see that coming and if, when I heard that thing I thought Oh, that's perfect. That's exactly what getting that diagnosis in your family is. I didn't see that coming. Uh, so I think that's important. Right now, you are all doing the right things. You are here, you're gathering information, you're learning more, you're connecting with other people. That's all great. That's exactly what you should be doing. Finding out all the resources because you are not alone. This is part of your family. This is part of your family and friends. Some of you might be working. Some of you might not be at this, at this age and stage. So there are lots of things that you are doing that's right. Uh, you're probably going to learn uh, from the talk after us about how important exercise is. Exercise is the, the really big sort of thing for treatment right now. And um, people haven't done a lot of exercise when they were younger, suddenly that seems harder. But I think it is so valuable. And that is something you can do as a couple. It's great. If two people are going out to do a walk, if two people are going out to do exercises, that makes it easier than just one person trying to say, well, I should go do. So I think that's great. Um, maintain your usual life. This is not a, a big secret. It's important to just share. It, other people are dealing with other things as well. So I think that that's really important. Keep your own social life. Keep your own, own um, physical life. Uh, I think all those are really important. Um, becoming 
Becoming the social CEO is more a care partner's part. I hear that a lot, trying to manage things, taking on more of the family management stuff, especially of activities. And at this Christmas, that's going to be a lot more of what care partners are going to be doing, is setting up those social events. Somebody, when we talked, um, when Carol and I did a, a something last week, somebody said, do things at lunchtime. You know, the, par the partner, the person with Parkinson's has more energy at lunch than maybe in the evening. So arrange a lunch, make it a potluck, have people bring things. And I thought all those sounded great. Y you, you will, over time, take on more of the family management issues. The kids will call, call the partners and ask, so how's mom, how's dad, those things. Self-care is your number one protection. That's the oxygen mask. Remember you get on places on, on planes and they say put on your oxygen mask, put on your life jacket first because you can't look after others unless you look after yourself. Your self-care, your hobbies, your activity, your exercise, all those things are part of your own self-care because that is really, really important. It creates that balance. The other thing, and I think my five minutes is just about up, so I'm saying our family motto has always been postpone nothing. Postpone nothing. Do what you can do now. Learn all you can. Plan, manage, understand some of the things that might be coming, but live in the now. Live in the now and postpone nothing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pat. That's great. Thanks. We're going to hold our questions until the end. I forgot to say that earlier. So, John, thank you so much, Pat. Okay, uh, the, these are actually, can people hear me? No. No? Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll use this. Um, so here, actually, I sent an email back to Carolyn. I said, well, I actually have four things that I, should, that I wish I would have known, plus one observation. And uh, the first observation I would say is uh, don't wait to start conventional Parkinson's disease medications or treatments. Um, that's an observation, and that's based upon, um, while it was not my experience, uh, I know of a person who worked with somebody who had Parkinson's disease for three years, and um, they refused or simply, yeah, I guess they simply refused to take uh, standard uh, treatments. And uh, so they were on all kinds of, and, and admittedly, I'm on that sort of stuff too, and I'm sure you've heard some of them or you've been on the internet and scope some of them out. But this person uh, wouldn't take conventional uh, treatment for about three years. And, uh, you know, it had a, it had a, what he, re, what he, what my, this person I work, who worked with him found out was that he had had significant fatigue related issues during the work day. And, um, you know, so it had a, it had a significant impact on, on this, uh, this particular individual. So he actually waited three years before he relented and started. And uh, so when he started, symptoms went away, fatigue went away. So, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't wait if you're thinking about uh, potentially waiting. And that's a discussion you'll have with your neurologist, uh, your neurologist anyway. Um, don't ignore what uh, might be PD symptoms or might be PD symptom related. On the other hand, uh, don't dwell on every little change that uh, might be going on. Um, sometimes the changes just happen to be, you know, you're exercising and, you know, you did something to a, a muscle or you, or you kind of tweak something. Um, but don't ignore it. Um, get it scoped out and look into it, especially if it, uh, especially if it persists. So actually, uh, my experience with that, the fall, fall of 2009, um, I ignored something for uh, <laughs> three months, thinking it was the stress of a work-related project. And so uh, and what, I was, what, what was happening was I was, I'm tremor predominant on my, uh, out of, on my left hand. And so I was keyboarding, and I noticed my keyboarding was a little off, not because my hand was tremoring, but because m my fingers were just slow. So I was compensating by... Reaching over with the reaching over with the right hand, um, and I figured that uh, you know oh, the stress of the project. It was three or four month project. I figured once the stress abated, um, this little keyboarding 
uh, issue would would abate, um, and it and it didn't. Uh, interestingly enough, so I called uh, the, uh, the clinic out at UBC and I said this is going on, and they said okay, well it's time to start on medication number two because I'm on on uh, two types of medication. So uh, don't wait, you know. On the other hand, I think Steve and I noticed in years you said don't let it, every little ache and pain, uh, you know. Anyway, so don't yeah, so don't wait. Um, you never know how people are going to react um, to a Parkinson's diagnosis. Um, at the time I was diagnosed, uh, my wife took a fair bit of time to uh, digest it. Uh, my teenage daughters kind of you know they're doing the teenage daughter thing, so they kind of were like, okay, dad has Parkinson's disease. What are we doing? Next? What are we doing this afternoon? Um, and uh, but interestingly enough, they did. When they hit about 21, 22, they did kind of make some inquiries about it and said, you know, do you think I'm going to get this? And I said, well, I have no idea, you know. But uh, obviously, they're uh, thinking about it, uh, thinking about it a little bit. Um, Watch, uh, I'm still working, so I have to kind of watch the uh, stress levels. And um, so watch the stress levels and compare what happens with your symptoms, because um, you might be uh, you might be kind of kind of surprised, because the stress uh, stress at work does amp up my symptoms a little bit. Uh, depends on the depends on the day and and what's uh, what's going on, uh, because apparently. I don't know where this, th this is my way of putting it, but um, it's kind of like I would say, uh, you remember, everyone remember that 70s electronic game Pac-Man? Well, my neurologist says if your stress level's up, then that thing chews through it like a Pac-Man. And, uh, which I think has generally been, uh, been my experience. But manage the stress levels with, uh, with exercise. Um, and the other thing is, uh, after diagnosis, in some instances, after you've been to a neurologist, in some instances it may be beneficial to see a physiotherapist for, with some Parkinson's disease experience uh, with things that may be uh, popping up um, as, as time progresses. Like right now I have a, um, it's been a little nagging, a tight glute muscle where it attaches up at the top of my hip. So is that, is that Parkinson's related? And, and I am left side... Uh, the issue is my left side, so is it Parkinson's related, Parkinson's related or is it, uh, you know, exercise related or, or something else? Um, and if you have a tight glute, invest in a um, really hard ball. I, lacrosse balls work great for self uh, self massage. Anyway, um, that's that's about it. Great. Thank you, John. And Margaret. Oh, thank you. Well, welcome to the club of PD <laughs> members, 12,000 of us in British Columbia in a club that no one wanted to join. Um, I hope today to just give you a few examples of major items that have impacted on me in the past uh, 13 years plus. I'm going to talk briefly in the classify classifications of decision-making and education. My mother was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease when she was a widow and had lived in the family home for many years. Her friends were close by and she wished to remain living in her house. She even planned to spend all her savings until she had to sell the house to go into care. Two doctors had indicated to me she was capable of making this decision. So at that point, I had two choices as the only adult child in the Lower Mainland and the uh, mother of her only grandchild. I could either help by doing chores on Saturday, looking after the finances, making sure she wasn't isolated as her uh, disease progressed, or I could say no and then she would be forced into care. So it was pretty obvious what decision I would make. But she had a fall, and I was called to the emergency. And when I got there, this nurse just went ballistic at me 
and started yelling at me and saying I had no biz I had no business allowing my mother to live that way. I informed her that two doctors had said she was capable of that decision and walked away. And I was left standing there thinking, well, what happened to the autonomy of the individual? It is her life. She's entitled to make it the decision she wanted. When I was diagnosed with Parkinson's, I uh, found that I could not work to the level that I wanted to be able to work at. So I decided that I would retire from work and maximize my lifestyle through travel, education, and exercise. And my family agreed to this, provided I would live by the motto that I would ask for help when I needed it. But until I ask, don't you come hovering around and every time I stand up, you run over to help me. These are hard decisions. They're not easy to make, but you have to make them. And you can make them with the help of your friends and coworkers, not coworkers, friends and your medical team, but they are yours to make. Education. Knowledge is invaluable in this club. Besides the traditional sources, you can read books, which I've brought um, some books that you're welcome to look at in the break. There's one on yoga for people with uh, physic, um, brain disorders, uh, et cetera. You can volunteer for experiments. This is a fantastic way to get to know the researchers out at UBC, to understand what's going on in the field, Yes, and you can be the uh, subject of various uh, experiments. You can volunteer to be a guinea pig for the med students. They practice interviewing and practice examining you. And you can attend the World Parkinson Congress next September. I'm sure you've heard about it. It's like playing tennis with Roger Federer in the same side of the net. There's the brilliant clinicians, researchers, doctors from all over the world, and you in this seminar. And it's an invaluable place to gain education. And when you're too much academia, you can do Tai Chi, you can do yoga, you can sing, you can dance. There's endless activities. So I strongly recommend you do that. The one topic near and dear to my heart is genetics. It is an unanswered topic for me. But if you're going to explore this, I really recommend that you do it with a genetics counselor. It's a highly charged emotional topic. And also, don't be surprised if family members don't want to participate. Um, it's relatively straightforward, I understand, to get the test done, test done, although sometimes the results may be problematic. However, these advances, which are a boon to research and general health, may give rise to discriminatory practices that are not prohibited by the current Canadian Human Rights Act. My genetic composition is my most personal building block. And I ask you, under what conditions, if any, should I be compelled to find out my genetic makeup or to uh, release my genetic makeup? Legislation has been introduced but never passed. Thus, you may wish to lobby our new government to protect this right. Now, I understand the hoopla or the blossom in any election is 90 days and then it just falls off back to reality where it was before. So if it interests you, perhaps you need to do something in 90 days. So we must not compromise our regular health because you know and you're slowly experiencing your eyes are getting drier because you don't blink enough. You can put on a mask, sometimes to your advantage. You get quieter speech. People go around, pardon, pardon, pardon. They can't hear you. You get round, instead of being upright, you start to round, and then your chin goes out. 
you have the endless problems with constipation, flatulence, sleep disorders, you're up half the night, then you're back to sleep. So you need to stay healthy to be a member of this club and to participate in your non-PD life activities. When there's a good day, it's great. Sometimes there's a bad day. And when there's a bad day, I go outside and for some reason the breeze on my face really helps. And I put on my earphones and I crank up the old rocker, Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> we made a promise we'll always remember. No retreat, baby, no surrender. <laughs> I cannot retreat, but I won't surrender. And I encourage you not to surrender. We need each other, and we need your energy to advance the cause for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret and Stephen. Stephen. Yes. Hopefully, I'm not going to repeat too much over what other people have already said. But following upon what Margaret said, the first thing is there's going to be good days and there's going to be bad days. But there would be those days, even if you didn't have Parkinson's disease, we all have our bad days when, when the weather, when it's raining, when the bills come and you don't want to have enough money to pay for them, when the, car, when, the traffic's, when the traffic's not going in your favor. Those things happen and so it's just get over it. Just think, think of the days that, that, that tomorrow is going to be another day and it could be just, it's going to be just as different as the next day. One, one thing John mentioned, don't treat every ailment that you think you've got as Parkinson's or as another sign of you getting, you're getting worse. Um, I, the reason I'm in a wheelchair is not because I'm, I've, got, I've got Parkinson's, it's because I've got a knee problem. But the knee, the knee may have got worse because I had Parkinson's because I didn't walk properly, but, but that wasn't, a, it wasn't the Parkinson's. I had the courage to go to my doctor and insist that I had a knee replacement. He, he said, well, you, you shouldn't need one, you, you just got to learn to live with it. So I've, I'm three weeks out of my surgery and I'm just getting better and I can't wait to get out of the wheelchair and get back at it. And, and so, so yes, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not always, always Parkinson's. But then on the other hand, remember that some, sometimes you're going to get sick and it will take you a little bit longer to recover. If you get a cold or you get the flu, it may take a little while longer for you to recover or you may hit you harder because you might tire more. So take time to get over those ailments. If you try and go straight back at it too soon, it's going to do you worse than if you just ride it through. Second point is to take advantage of the, I call them allied health professions, physiotherapists, speech therapists, or occupational therapists. For years, I went to, I, I went to my, my um, neurologist and he didn't mention anything about seeing these people. Finally, a year ago, I went to speech language therapy and got referred to um, Holy Cross Hospital, and went through an intensive program of learning how to, how to control your voice. Uh, they, they also showed me some of the, the tips and tricks for using the things like using the computer, large telephones, special keyboards for your computer, things that you're going to ultimately need, but, but they, they can really make your life a lot easier. So try, yes. Yeah, so if I don't know how you get referred, often you've got to be referred to these places, and it's, it's, it's you've got to be your own advocate, knowing what sort of things are out there that you can benefit from. Third thing is to get get involved with a support group. I know for many people, when you first diagnose, you don't want to see people that are further along than you were. For years, I avoided going to a support group because I didn't want. I, I was fairly young. I was only 43. I didn't want to see people, 70-year-old people, shaking and dribbling and falling over. But eventually, we started a group. We started up a new group in Ladner, and it's been the, one of the best things that I've done. We've got a very, very good group of friends. We can be very candid with each other. We can, and, and in fact, it's, humor is probably one of the most things that we, we find we get through. We can't get through a, a session without having a laugh at ourselves. So keep, keep, keep. Uh, the, so. Make like you know, the people at the Parkinson Society can put you in touch with the group, and if, if there's not one in your area, don't be frightened to try and start one. There's another service that the, the, the uh, Parkinson Society has, which is called the PD Link. I've been a, I've been a, a mentor. That's where a person with a new diagnosis can speak one on one with a, with a person that's been experienced and gone through the system. And often speaking to someone else about the disease can be a lot more beneficial than talking to a doctor or a health professional. 
Next thing is forget, forget your, 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 your old life, the good old days, and focus on how well you're going to do and try new things. For me, I was very active as a young, young man. I used to run a lot, swim a lot, bicycle. I found when I got Parkinson's, I got discouraged from that because I couldn't do it as well as I used to do. But then I, then I discovered Aquafit, which is running in water. And I've, that, that was a way that I could handle my knee and I could actually get the exercise. That was something I wouldn't have ordinarily tried. I also tried Tai Chi, and that, that was another example. Not something else I wouldn't have ordinarily tried if I hadn't had Parkinson's. And coming from the, the, the next one is, your spouse or your care partner probably knows you better than anyone. And so if you go to a medical appointments, don't be afraid to bring your partner along with you. And if, if you can, it may be beneficial for your partner to have a one-on-one -on -one with the doctor. Being a man, obviously, most many males deny what their, their medical problems, things are okay. They, 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 if, if they ask, the doctor asks you how are things, oh, they're okay, I'm not too bad. But if they ask your wife, they'll probably tell you half the things that... that, that, that You just say, well, I'm just shaking a little bit. She say, well, you, you spilled your coffee last week. <laughs> That's the third time this month that you've done that. The last, the last thing is be, be very careful about what you read on the internet and, and where, where, what information you get. You can go onto the internet and there'll be a lot of these chat groups. A lot of it's very negative and a lot of it's oriented around the drug industry. Focus on, on, on the, more, um, uh, the, the more reputable websites like Michael J. Fox, Davis Finney, the Parkinson's Disease Foundation. So treat, treat any, everything you read on the internet, treat with a degree of skepticism. So thanks very much. Bye. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful. So now we are going to open up the floor. Any questions for our lovely panelists that came here today? Just re there we go. Thank you. Um, my question is for John. Mm -hmm. um, I was just reading your bio, and, and you're quite active. Yeah. And I'm going to, I don't normally speak for my husband, but he's also quite active in the ultra. He was ultra um, oh, right, before. Yeah. yeah, okay. And so um, how do you find with Parkinson the level of um, too much exercise versus enough exercise? Like, because PJ's so driven that he would go absolutely every day for exercise, which is awesome, and it makes my life as a care partner super yeah. easy. Yeah, that's but right. is there too, is too much versus, like, how do you find in your own personal life where to stop or is this, balance? I'm assuming it? this is still on. Um, actually, I, I, don't, I don't think I've uh, found that point yet. Um, <laughs> and and I, don't, I, I don't go crazy, although they, I was part of an exercise study out at the Parkinson's Research Center, which I think is still going on. And um, so I, I've had a discussion with them about you know, how much is too much. Um, but I, I mean, I, I don't go crazy, but I mean, I, I snowshoe. I think it's in there. And I, you know, I snowshoe and, and do a bunch of, uh, bunch of stuff. I do yoga. Um, right now, my amount of uh, cardio has kind of backed off a bit, and I am, I'm having a feeling that I need to, you know, sort of amp that up a bit. Um, but they did mention at the Parkinson's uh, Center out at UBC that, you know, don't go, don't go overboard. But on the other hand, you know, I, I go up to Mount Seymour uh, during the wintertime, although, you know, last winter was kind of the pits for snowshoeing. But, uh, you know, we'll be gone for you know, three or four hours, we'll go up to the top of the first pump and, you know, we'll be back. And I haven't found, I haven't found it to be detrimental in, in chewing through the, you know, the dopamine supplies. And I'll tell you an interesting story. And I told this to my neurologist uh, out at UBC uh, a year later. I went snowshoeing um, in the spring of 2012. And at that time, I was taking three tablets of uh, levodopa carbidopa. Uh, 100 over 25 dosage and I get up to <laughs> I, I take I also take one other uh, I also take Azelect so I took both of those in the morning uh, went up to Mount Seymour get up to the parking lot realize I haven't got any of my damn levodopa carbidopa 
And so I, you know, we headed up, and um, at that time, we stopped for lunch at the top, no hand tremor at all. Come back down, I noticed I was getting a little bit of, because I do get a little bit of dystonia in my left foot. I got a little bit of dystonia, but of course my hiking boots are cranked up as tight as they can go. So I just kind of chugged through it and it actually uh, went away. So I actually didn't take a, my second dose until four o'clock in the afternoon. And so I told my neurologist that and um, you know, I said that as far as I'm concerned, that's kind of the my own experience with the importance of the importance of exercise. Now, full disclosure, I'm on more dopamine since then, but um, you know, the exercise I think is important. But you know, you got to balance it, balance it out. Do we have any other questions? Well, that's okay. Um, they'll probably be sticking around until the end of the day. So, um, if anybody wants, oh, Dave. Probably should have asked the doctor this question, but maybe you can help me. I've been to uh, two specialists and one regular doctor, and I have been disappointed in the information lack that I've got in all the, all these departments. Maybe I'm expecting too much. I don't know. The only thing they talk about is the medication. No, don't talk about exercise. What has been your experience and how have you handled, or have you found that to be true in your case? And if so, how did you handle it? I think the exercise is gonna be talked about a bit by Naomi. Um, just to, she's an exercise expert. She's been trained by Becky Farley. She is um, a physio and you can see her bio and I know she's gonna talk about it. Um, she, George has been going to her for a while and uh, she has them work really hard. I went to observe the first one and I thought, holy crow, this is skookum stuff. And he's down on the seawall doing, uh, you know, these, uh, first thing and then he's walking and running and she's got him down he has to practice and get down to a 10 minute kilometer I think it is and so I mean uh, George you could put your hand up so they know who I'm talking about <laughs> you know so I I think that the exercise is is definitely out there the doctors aren't physiotherapists and they try to keep up and I think that a lot of the doctors are becoming more aware of it, but I, I do agree that they don't know all those different things. A, a comment, and we've had him speak twice in Vancouver, but, and I mentioned at the table we're sitting on is uh, Ashclog's book, the, new, the Treatment of Parkinson's Church. You want to hold up the book there? Um, that book, I don't know if you guys have looked at this book. I Every question we have about Parkinson's in the old book, and now this is the new book that's only been out two months, I go in the index in the back, and he's got something about it. And when he came and spoke in Vancouver, one of the first things he said, everything I know about Parkinson's, I learned from my patients. So you know, sort of, he's listening. So I, I can't say enough. I, I <laughs> I, I'm always bragging about this book, both the old one and the new one. So I find it helpful to go in with my questions written down, and I tell my neurologist, you know, I've got five questions today or four questions, and I don't let him finish until I get all my questions. And I just think they're very busy, they're extremely knowledgeable, but you're the patient, and uh, you need to answer my questions. One of the. Is this on? Yeah. I don't know how many of you go to your GP to uh, regularly, but I find the GP doesn't know very anything at all about Parkinson's. I know more about Parkinson's than my GP. We all keep referring to neurologists that we go to, but we only go to see them once every 12 months. Um, I don't know if there's, I don't know if the, there's, a, there's an, an, an in, a, a, a directory of doctors that are specialists in Parkinson's, but that's something that I'd like to see. I don't know if that's something the Parkinson's Society can lobby for. 
but I, I, I don't I don't treat my I don't consider my GP as my Parkinson's doctor. I consider the the specialists at UBC as my Parkinson's doctors. I don't know. Say everybody's got the luxury of having a neurologist and a GP, but for many of us, we're, we're, we're fortunate that we can have both. And I, I just want to make a comment there further to that as well, is that I think in this day and age, we can't rely on our doctor, unfortunately, to be sort of the guru that we go to. And that's why we have things like this for you to educate yourself and for you to be able to, to knowledge, um, build up your knowledge points so that you can go with, with a list of things and say, well, I learned that I should be doing exercise. You know, what can I get a referral to a physiotherapist? So knowing these things and sort of Neurologists and the GPs are just so busy, so um, you have to be your own advocate, I believe. Yeah, and yeah. You don't need a referral for a physio? Just, yeah. You don't need a referral for a physio? Okay, that's news. Different, changed. Awesome. Okay, so I think that's about it. Is there any other questions right now before we carry on? Okay, just one more down here. Um, just want to ask you, is any food that you should avoid or any food that you should take that you find helpful? Well, I've just been told that when you take your levodopa or your cinnamet, you don't take it with protein. Be sure not to have protein and try and take your medicine within an hour of food. That's all I... Yeah, I think that's the case. Although uh, um, a couple of years in, after starting on levodopa carbidopa, I said to my uh, the neurological fellow, I said, uh, "Does that include?" I, I use a uh, you know a Vega protein powder, and I said, "Does that include vegetable protein?" She said, "A protein is a protein is a protein." <laughs> now that so I haven't I haven't f like I haven't found that it interrupts it that much because I still put a plant protein on my cereal in the morning and you know that's 45 minutes after taking my first uh, you know uh, dose of levodopa carbidopa so yeah it's I, I, I must admit on some occasions I'll think you know it's interfering um, so you know just be careful of it I think is one thing to comment on. And I just wanted to also mention that the Parkinson Society has um, a lot of help sheets on all of this stuff. So I know today is a lot to grasp and, you know, yeah, they said something about protein. What was that? So we do, if you connect with us or go on our website at uh, the Parkinson Society BC, we have printouts on almost every topic that, that can help you. These are some examples I printed off on the care partnering. Uh, and caregiving, those are important, and they're all on the website. Uh, the webinars that are on the Michael J. Fox uh, Foundation, the webinars that are on there are wonderful. I think the next one coming up this week is on balance. You know, so there's a lot of great webinars on both the National, the, the National Found, uh, Parkinson's Foundation, the, um, the Michael J. Fox, and the other one, I'm just the yeah, name. The, 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 oh, if you can go on ahead. There's a lot of things on there that are being set up already around the World Parkinson's Conference coming up. So there's lots of info on that computer if you're using the right places. Right, guys? <laughs> yeah, there's lots of junk out there, of course, as we all know. <laughs> And again, if you have any questions, the Parkinson Society has an info line. So just call and say, I want to see webinars. Where can I do that? So there's lots of stuff for you. All right. I think we are going to move on to the next segment.